Let me try not to say too much. Who needs one? Ready, Jim? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Light. I'm the department head for social sciences, and I wanted to thank you all for attending this presentation, part of our uh, annual race and ethnicity conference. This is another great example of the collaboration that takes place between departments here on campus. Uh, Professor Tower is from the English department, and he was kind enough to, uh, as many of his colleagues in the past have done, to be a part of this presentation and this conference, which is so important to what we do uh, in our department. I wanted to make you aware of one event in this conference that I think is uh, special, and uh, not that they're not all good, they all are very good. Uh, but we're really pleased this year to have a Pulitzer Prize winning author as our keynote speaker. Her name is Isabel Wilkerson. She's a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, the title of the book um, that was on the bestseller list is called The Warmth of Other Suns, and it's about the great migration of African Americans from the South to the industrial North and the West Coast uh, during the turn of the century around World War I. And she's going to be speaking Thursday night at 7.30 in the Spectrum Theater. And there's even some free food, so I know college students turn up for free food. She's a big deal. I keep telling people she's been on Oprah. That's my barometer for whether you're a big deal or not. So she is a big deal. Um, if you could uh, find it in your schedule to attend, I think that would be phenomenal. You'll, you'll learn a lot, and she's an amazing speaker. Um, today, however, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Carol Redwine. She's going to introduce our speaker, David Tower, for the day. Good afternoon. Troll glad to see everyone. Right. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Great. I'm glad to see you all here, and I'm really happy to introduce uh, Mr. Tower to all of you. Many of you probably know him already. I've known him for several years. Uh, I was his mentor when he came to the English department. I also am from the English department, and I'm presently teaching in the teacher education department. So we have a long history together, and when he asked me to introduce him, I was very happy to do so. So let me introduce you to David James Tower. He is professor of English here at Grand Rapids Community College. He received his bachelor's degree in English from Central Michigan University in 1975. Now you do the math. He's already told me how many years that is, but you do the math, and then I won't have to say anything. Uh, he has a Master of Arts in English from Michigan State University, which he received in 1991, and his focus was teaching English at the community college and featured a month at London University, and that is the London in England. <laughs> he has taught at elementary and secondary levels here in Michigan, and for two years he taught in Kuwait, where he had students of approximately seven different ethnicities in a fourth grade classroom. Now those of you who might want to be teachers, think about that challenge for a moment. And he said he learned to count to seven in Arabic. <laughs> Since 1990, he has taught exclusively at the college level, always here at GRCC, though he did teach some classes at Kalamazoo Valley Community College and at GVSU. He has been full-time here at GRCC since 1999. He loves his job, and I have a personal testimony to that. He does love his job. He has taught English 101 and 102, which, as you know, are our composition courses. He has also taught 261 and 262, our Great American Classes 1 and 2. He also has some familiarity, he says, with his topic, so I think that we can trust what he says today, though he says he's not an expert. He has published poetry and prose, along with some photography. I'd like to see those pictures. And at some intervals, he has done this, but he is most proud to be the father of twin sons. Both of them are named after literary figures, Simon from the Bible and Langdon from the narrator of Kenneth Roberts' Northwest Passage. He has lots of interests, lots of passions, too many to mention. He loves books and students and writing and trains and hiking and the Detroit Tigers, which he fully expects to win the World Series every year. <laughs> we can only continue to be so optimistic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tower. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today. I, can everyone hear me all right? I feel like I'm talking to the, into the air, but I guess it works. OK, so um, I knew that I was getting involved in something that was a little dicey when I, when I signed up for a social sciences uh, conference. Uh, I was looking at the list of presentations and and I see things like uh, 
the impact of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments on <laughs> higher education, a story of interdisciplinarity. That's a mouthful. So I decided to just go with something like thoughts um, <laughs> concerning <laughs> American literature and race and ethnicity. Now, I'm going to have trouble saying that, so I've decided that I'm going to start out with uh, a disclaimer, and, and I'm going to use a, a brief example of race and ethnicity, which happens to do with um, some of our fellow Michiganders, uh, of course, um, most of you, some of you actually might be youpers, um, but if I were a youper, I would simply shorten that down to race and ethnicity. <laughs> much more, much easier to say. Um, you know, youpers are a sort of ethnicity all their own. Um, pretty much nobody farther south than Green Bay really pays much attention. But uh, it carries with it, that term youper carries with it a certain cachet, uh, set of characteristics we um, automatically associate with somebody from anywhere north of the Mackinac Bridge, even from Salt St. Marie. <laughs> Let's put it this way. If you're drinking a Budweiser in the back row at your brother's wedding near Ishpeming, you just might be a youper. That's a true story, by the way. <laughs> I saw that happen. But I bring all this up because every one of us is prone to categorize our fellow citizens in the United States as a Yankee or a New Yorker or an Indian or an African American. American literature isn't just a mirror for these concepts. In fact, American literature has, from time to time, actually shaped our perceptions of groups, of groups of people, both racial groups and ethnic groups. I, so since John Smith was kind enough to spin those tales about Jamestown and Pocahontas and the Pamunkey and all those sorts of things, um, since Mary Rowlandson was captured by the heathen Narragansetts. We're going to see Mary Rowlandson today, by the way. Since Frederick Douglass electrified crowds with his abolitionist commentary. Since Sinclair Lewis exposed the brutal conditions of immigrant workers in the stockyards of Chicago. Since Martin Luther King Jr. intoned, I have a dream. Since Eddie Murphy turned himself into a caricature of Mr. Rogers as the Mr. Robinson of Mr. Robinson's neighborhood. And we're going to take a look at that because I think of this as a form of American literature. And I also think it's really funny. And I'm going to have some ideas about why after we view this. But um, one little second disclaimer is that uh, because we're not really supposed to be watching this. It is posted on YouTube, um, but it's backward so that it didn't get blocked. So you're going to see things backward, but you're going to hear things forward. <laughs> How does that work? So can we bring that up? If you go to, it should be the first one. There it is, and we can make it big too. With that little thing. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be my? Could you be my? I always want to live in a house like yours, my friend. Maybe when there's nobody home, I'll break in. So a mad woman said she was rich, spent all the money, walked out on the bitch. <laughs> Won't you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Hello, boys and girls. You're probably wondering why Mr. Robinson is putting on his glitter shoes. Well, these are rock and roll shoes, boys and girls. Do you know why? Let's look at our word for the day. 
You can't read it, boys and girls, because it's the Soul Train Scramble Boy. <laughs> word for the day. See what these are, boys and girls? They're drums. That's a musical instrument, you know. Do you know where drums come from? From Africa. <laughs> you know where these drums come from? Smokey Robinson was at the Apollo Theater and left his van open in the back of the place. I ripped them off. <laughs> There's more to that, but uh, you get the idea. Now, as a literature professor, um, I'm doomed to attempt incessantly to get into the mind of the author of any text, and so I'm asking you to consider the implications of that YouTube clip. My take is we have a black man impersonating a white man, impersonating a caring father figure who is just trying to help the boys and girls untangle the web of racial tension that seems to haunt ev us every day. And it's pretty funny, as I said earlier. So if we can go back, oh, we're just in the right place. Um, I'm gonna offer some definitions, and these are my own. I didn't look them up in the dictionary or anything. But um, just so we're clear about what my approach is today, we have these words, race, what do we perceive? It's, race is, we've come to know that race is a somewhat specious sort of concept, but it still is real in terms of people's perceptions. Ethnicity, a group, usually a nationality, but it can be something like Uber's as well. Um, we're gonna hear a couple of other words that they, they carry a lot of meaning with them, such as those, barbarian, devil, savage. These are words that were used in early American literature quite liberally, and they usually apply to those types of people, especially the not Christian, uncivilized, and dangerous part. And then we're also going to hear the N word quite a bit. Um, I hope that you will simply take that as a window into American literature. The N-word was used um, over and over by people such as Twain, and we will hear some of that today. So I hope no offense is taken by anyone because it's part of the literature, and that's what we're here to look at, is the literature. So. If we can go to our next slide. I'm gonna use a framework today for uh, the particular authors and eras that I'm going to ask you to consider. And the framework is this author, Solomon Northup, um, who is a, an, an author whom we address in English 261, the early half of American literature. And Northup has a kind of an interesting story uh, he was born a free black man in about 1808 and lived quite a common uh, workday life for a number of years until 1841 when he was, um, much a, a, a surprise to him, kidnapped and sold into slavery where he spent the next 12 years without um, any way of figuring out a, how to get out of his situation. Um, he tried to write letters, he tried to contact people that might know him, but he was unable to be successful until 1853, so he spent 12 years in slavery. And one thing about Northup um, is we only have the one book that he offered, which is called 12 Years a Slave, and um, 
He did have an editor for that book whose name was David Wilson. And interestingly enough, David Wilson is the name that Mark Twain chose for the um, main character, well, one of the main characters of his novel, Puddinhead Wilson, which um, is also very heavily involved with what is slavery about. But Northup was, he was something of a Renaissance man for his circumstances and was able to um, put together a fair number of pretty valid observations based on his experience during those 12 years as a slave. Um, what I'm going to do is we're gonna shift using Northup into a section here about um, Native Americans and how American literature has addressed the whole Native American issue. So to do that, I'm going to have uh, some help from a reader, Christina Larson, who's going to read a, a short section from Northup's book, which describes the, the period of time when he was early in Louisiana as a slave, but he had, had a chance to observe a certain group of Native Americans. And I'll let Christina read and you can glean from that what you can, and then we'll, I'll have a couple of comments afterward. So, Christina? Hmm. Thank you, Carol. Indian Creek and its whole length flows through a magnificent forest. There dwells on its shore a tribe of Indians, a remnant of the Chickasaws or Chickasees, if I remember rightly. They live in simple huts, 10 or 12 feet square, constructed of pine poles and covered with bark. They subsist principally on the flesh of the deer, the coon, and opossum, all of which are plenty in these woods. Sometimes they exchange venison for a little corn and whiskey with the planters on the bayou. Their usual dress is buckskin breeches and calico hunting shirts of fantastic colors, buttoned from belt to chin. They wear brass rings on their wrists and in their ears and noses. The dress of the squaws is very similar. They are fond of dogs and horses, owning many of the latter of a small tough breed and are skillful riders. Their bridles, girths, and saddles were made of raw skins of animals, their stirrups of a certain kind of wood. Mounted astride their ponies, men and women, I have seen them dash out into the woods at the utmost of their speed, following the narrow winding paths and dodging trees in a manner that eclipsed the most miraculous feats of civilized equestrianism. Circling away in various directions, the forest echoing and re-echoing of their whoops, they would presently return at the same dashing, headlong speed, which with they started. Their village was on Indian Creek, known as Indian Castle, but their range extended to the Sabine River. Occasionally, a tribe from Texas would come over on a visit. And then there was indeed a carnival in the Great Pine Woods. Chief of the tribe was Cascala, second in rank, John Baltiste, his son-in-law with both of whom, as with many others of the tribe, I became acquainted during my frequent voyages down the creek with rafts. Sam and myself would often visit them when the day's task was done. They were obedient to the chief. The word of Cascala was their law. They were a rude but harmless people and enjoyed their wild mode of life. They had a little fancy for the open country, the cleared lands on the shores of the bayous, but preferred to hide themselves within the shadows of the forest. They worshiped the great spirit loved whiskey, and were happy. On one occasion, I was present at a dance when a roving herd from Texas had encamped in their village. The entire carcass of a deer was roasting before a large fire, which threw its light a long distance among the trees under which they were assembled. When they had formed in a ring, men and squaws, alternately a sort of Indian fiddle set up by an indescribable tune. It was a continuous, melancholy kind of wavy sound with the slightest possible variation. At the first note, if indeed there was more than one note in the whole tune, they circled around, trotting after each other, and giving utterance to a guttural sing-song noise, equally as nondescript as the music of the fiddle. At the end of the third circuit, they would suddenly whoop, as if their lungs would crack, then break from the ring, swarming in couples, man and squaw, each jumping backwards as far as possible from the other, then forwards, which graceful feat having been twice or thrice accomplished. 
They would form her inner ring and go trotting round again. The best dancer appeared to be considered the one who could whoop the loudest, jump the farthest, and utter the most excruciating noise. At intervals, one or more would leave the dancing circle and going to the fire, cut from the roasting carcass a slice of venison. Thank you, Christina. Interestingly, that account um, is still used today as uh, original evidence of the, the uh, behaviors of that particular tribe or nation of Native Americans. And it was written by Solomon Northup, a slave at the time, well, at the time he was observing. And I think really demonstrates the um, ability of Northup to take an, an even-handed look at the world he was experiencing, a world which, of course, involved him as a slave. And he was exceptionally even-handed in his treatment of the institution of slavery in that um, volume. And we'll hear a little bit more from him later on. But now, it's time to move to Europeans and settlements in the United States. And of course, most of you probably know, and if we could go forward one, that one of our most renowned, maybe notorious early settlers was John Smith himself, who um, had quite a life uh, previous to his decision to join a, um, a group of colonists. He, uh, he was an adventurer, a soldier. He fought in several European wars as a mercenary. He was knighted in Transylvania for reputedly defeating and beheading three Turkish commanders. Most of this we take with a grain of salt. Um, John Smith had a tendency to do a bit of exaggerating with his writings. But concerning Jamestown, Smith is pretty much all we have. He, he is the one account that we look at as a way of trying to untangle what was happening in that settlement. So I'm going to ask my helper to go to the second video, if you would. It should be that one. <laughs> It's too bad we couldn't find Captain Smith. Yes. They seem very close, Pocahontas and the captain. They were like brother and sister. <laughs> they were brother and sister. How do you mean? Pocahontas was 12 years old when she first saw the English settlers. She was amazed at how the settlers lived. Every day she'd come to the edge of the woods and watch. I wish she'd come out. We go and make friends with the Indians somehow. <laughs> She's a shy one. Not for long. Why you say that? Just a hunch. That, she was a common sight in Jamestown. She persuaded her father, Chief Powhatan, to help us survive. <laughs> It'll never last the winter. Mm. Not with 300 more settlers coming. We'll have to ask Powhatan for more. Forty baskets of corn. Forty baskets? Chief Powhatan, last time you gave us 200 baskets for this much. I am different now. Forty baskets. That is supposedly a fairly realistic uh, replay of 
some of the negotiations that went on be between the Native Americans, the Pamunkey, and Smith and the colonists. But the next part that you're going to see is probably entirely fabricated. So let's go ahead. You should have given them more. They will starve. Good. Then they will go back where they came from. No, father. You are a child, Pocahontas. You do not understand. The white man will take and take until the Algonquian are left with nothing. They had to. You are foolish. <laughs> A gift for you, Chief Balhat, the leader of the English devils. That scene um, is, is really well known and um, pretty much certainly an exaggeration by Smith, um, who in his memoirs uh, reported that he was saved by beautiful women no less than three times in his life. But Smith's influence was, was profound. He, he was read by the English in England. He was also read by future settlers in, in, uh, on this continent. And his perceptions of Native Americans were, um, they, they really had an impact. Now, I'm going to ask Adam to read a section, a very short section of Smith, um, which gives us a little different sort of uh, version of what we just saw on the screen. Here, more than 200 of those grim courtiers stood wondering at him, as he had been a monster, till Powhatan and his train had put themselves in the greatest braveries. Before a fire upon his seat like a bedstead, he sat covered with a great robe made of raccoon skins and all the tails hanging by. On either hand did sit a young woman wench of 16 or 18 years, and along on each side of the house two rows of men, and behind them as many women, with all their heads and shoulders painted red. Many of their heads bedecked with white down of birds, but every one with something, and a great chain of white beads about their necks. If you listen closely, you'll know that Smith had a, had a habit of using particular terms in referring to the Native Americans that he encountered. For instance, grim courtiers, 
would be a remake of a European term, um, people who would stand at the court of a European sort of king. Um, they were grim, however, and their heads and shoulders painted red starts us into thinking about sort of devils. He called the Indians red devils, naked devils, all kinds of terms that um, would certainly have influenced his readers. So go ahead, Adam. At his entrance before the king, all the people gave a great shout, having feasted him after their best barbarous manner they could. A long consultation was held, but the conclusion was two great stones were brought before Pohatan. Then as many as could lay hands on him, dragged him to them, and thereon laid his head, and being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains, Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save from him death, whereat the emperor was contented. Thank you, Adam. And Pohatan was Smith's name for the um, Pamunkey leader. He was the leader of the Pohatan Confederacy. It wasn't his real name, but that's all Smith could figure out was to call him that. Um, it, it's hard to calculate the amount of influence. I, you've probably noticed that there have been retellings and retellings of the Jamestown story, and almost every time John Smith turns out to be some sort of hero, when in fact I think his effect on American literature was uh, less than congenial in a, in a number of ways. But he's hardly a match for another early writer named Mary Rowlandson, who um, emigrated from England in the early 1600s. Um, she, with her family, she settled in Massachusetts. And um, yeah, we can go to her. <laughs> we don't have any real images of Mary Rowlandson. That's the best we can do. But um, she married and was, was actually raising a family when a particular conflict broke out. And it was called King Philip's War. Um, when the groups of Indians, I'm going to say Indians or Native Americans, I, I hope you notice that I, I just go back and forth between that. So I can do that because I'm a literature instructor. Um, they, they settled there in a, in a place called Lancaster, and then during King Philip's War, Lancaster was raided by Narragansetts, a certain Indian nation, and pretty much was wiped out. Um, this was a back and forth war, which eventually, this was the English, essentially, who were, who were um, in conflict with the several nations of uh, Native Americans in that region. But um, she was captured by the Indians and was taken prisoner for quite some time, um, nearly a month, um, along with one of her children. Now, Rowlandson wrote an account of this, an account of her captivity during the, this war. And it was wildly successful as a publication. She, I believe that over the next 20 or 30 years, it was republished 10 or 15 times and uh, was, was read with relish, apparently, by um, English uh, and other types of uh, colonists during that period. What I'm trying to point out is that Rowlandson herself had another rather wide-reaching influence on the thoughts of the new Americans concerning Native Americans. And what I'm going to do is ask uh, one of my students, Melanie, to come up and read a section, a short section of the account of her captivity. And I, I hope that you'll listen in for some of those same types of terms that were applied by Smith in his account. Mm -hmm. 
Now is the dreadful hour come that I've often heard of in time of war, as it was the case of others, but now mine eyes see it. Some in our house were fighting for their lives, others wallowing in their blood, the house on fire over our heads, and the bloody heathen ready to knock us on the head if we stirred out. Now might we hear mothers and children crying out for themselves and one another, Lord, what shall we do? Then I took my children and one of my sisters, hers, to go forth and leave the house, but as soon as we came to the door and appeared, the Indians shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house, as if one had taken a handful of stones and threw them so that we were fain to give back. We had six stout dogs belonging to our garrison, but none of them would stir, though another time, if any Indian had come to the door, they were ready to fly upon him and tear him down. The Lord hereby would make us the more acknowledge his hand and to see that our help is always in him. Just to point out one bit there about that part, the dogs were important to Rowlandson because she believed that the, by the dogs not reacting was a sign from, from God. Um, she was a devout Christian and believed that uh, God would protect and prevail in the end for her and, and her people. But out we must go, the fire increasing, and coming along behind us, roaring, and the Indians gaping before us with their guns, spears, and hatchets to devour us. No sooner were we out of the house, but my brother-in-law, being before wounded and defending the house, in or near the throat, fell down dead, whereat the Indians scornfully shouted and howled, and were presently upon him, stripping off his clothes, the bullets flying thick. One went through my side, and the same, as would seem, through the bowels and hand of my dear child in my arms. This child was six years old and um, was shot during the opening conflict there. Um, and if that, I hope that's clear, that Rowlandson managed to create quite an emotional response with that brief little account of the shooting of a six-year-old child in her arms. Now away we must go with those barbarous creatures, with our bodies wounded and bleeding, and our hearts no less than our bodies. About a mile we went that night, up upon a hill within sight of the town where they intended to lodge. This was the dolefulest night that ever my eyes saw. Oh, the roaring and singing and dancing and yelling of those black creatures in the night, which made the place a lively resemblance of hell. Consequently, uh, the Narragansetts here are uh, painted, as it were, with a, a clear uh, parallel to uh, the devil and hell. Uh, they're barbarous creatures. Uh, they're black creatures in the night. And it's, the whole scene for her is a lively resemblance of hell. Thus, nine days I sat upon my knees with my babe in my lap. About two hours in the last night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18, 1675, it being about six years and five months old. It was nine days from the first wounding, in this miserable condition without any refreshing of one nature or other, except a little cold water. I have thought since of the wonderful goodness of God to me in preserving me in the use of my reason and senses in that distressed time, that I did not use wicked and violent means to end my own miserable life. Thank you. So you can imagine the impact that that sort of a writing would have had on um, her fellow colonists, settlers, um, who were just beginning to move into the continent at that time. So if we can go forward one. Um, it's clear to me that um, we're going to run out of time. So uh, I, I'm just going to make a brief mention of this particular offering that I was going to do some reading for you from. Um, there was a, a piece published by uh, two men, really, Handsome Lake and Chief Corn Planter, which essentially um, was a, a sort of lament for what had happened since the settlers had begun coming over from Europe and um, 
essentially kept pushing and pushing and pushing Native Americans farther and farther westward. Um, and uh, this piece, it's written or was spoken by a, a man named Handsome Lake. And um, I'll just read one little part because it's, it's kind of fascinating how this works. I, I wish I could give you the whole story, but um, the, there's a narrator of the piece who is fooled by um, a man who is supposedly the devil and who is going to um, do some work for this man because he thinks this might be a reincarnation of God or the Savior. And the man, sorry, I have to look over my glasses. Um, he makes a deal with the devil, in fact. And the devil says, I'm going to make you rich and powerful. And he wants this man to take certain items across the ocean to give to the Native Americans. And the list of items is fascinating to me. Um, he says, take these cards, playing cards, uh, this money, this fiddle, this whiskey, and this blood corruption, and give them to, the, to all the people across the water. The cards will make them gamble away their goods and idle away their time. The money will make them dishonest and covetous. The fiddle will make them dance with women, and, lower, and their lower natures will command them. The whiskey will excite their minds to evil doing and turn their minds, and blood corruption will eat their strength and rot their bones. Um, this was part of a movement of Native Americans to recreate what their culture had been like before the arrival of the Europeans. Um, and essentially, it was, uh, it didn't work. Um, but it was an attempt, at least, at revisiting what their culture had been like before those five items had been brought across the ocean by, guess who? <sighs> um, by the way, blood corruption, if you're wondering what that means, it, it simply means intermixing of races, essentially, which at that time was considered a, uh, an unhealthy sort of practice. So, if we could go forward. Um, Benjamin Franklin, of course, is, is known to most of you for his contributions in, in any number of arenas. But he was, in fact, intensely um, intrigued and interested in the Native American question. And once again, I'm going to have to um, condense what I was going to offer here concerning Franklin. Um, but Franklin wrote a piece called Remarks Concerning the Savages of North America. And he, he essentially was, it was based on a, uh, a gathering where the Treaty of Lancaster was, was decided upon in Pennsylvania. And while the treaty in the end uh, did the Native Americans no favors, the, the whites, as I will call them, um, essentially interpreted it as um, giving them free reign to move as far west in Virginia as they chose to. And at that time, Virginia actually extended all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So um, the Indians interpreted it another way. But of course, um, the whites had one thing that the Indians did not, which was firearms. And so in the end, uh, they pretty much had their way. Um, Franklin, however, pointed out several things for, about his perceptions concerning Native Americans. And in the end, he concluded that despite the fact that they, they had no real government, as it were, um, and they had no written language, they, in fact, were, um, in a certain way, equally civilized or possibly more civilized than the whites that they were dealing with. And Franklin wanted to point that out um, in this piece. And I think he succeeds pretty well. But I'm just going to have to move forward so that we get to a few other issues here. One last 
part of the Native American section. And I just want to show you that uh, Native American literature is still alive and well. And this is a, uh, a man who, I lost my list, is still living, obviously, and um, he lives in Minnesota. He's an Anishinaabe, which is the more correct term for what we call Chippewas or Ojibwa. And um, he's still publishing, and in a, in a remarkable way, I find him refreshing and um, somewhat humorous at the same time. I'm just going to have uh, Mike show us a uh, a short video of, that features one of his uh, poems. So I'll let it speak for itself at this point. Me bin. If you're real careful and only cut through the outer layer, the tree continues to live. Wigwas. Time to gather bark. Another gift from the Creator. Just doing what Grandpa did like his Grandpa before him. Went with a cousin I've known since we ate oatmeal from the same bowl. Mosquitoes and deer flies welcomed us to their feast. A sparrow hawk flew by, supper in his feet. Watched a deer feeding in the shallows. Each tree leads to others farther from the road. Found one that's been waiting 60 years to become a basket. A cut allows the bark to crack, crack open. Hands slipped inside feel the smooth wet. The bark jumps from the tree, eager to help us make a basket or two. Finally, we have enough bark. It is time to go home. We're getting hungry. <laughs> okay, so we still have uh, a fairly vibrant Native American literary community um, that is accessible to all. But it's time to move to a, another issue today, and, and that issue has to do with race again, and that is the literary treatment of the African American question, which has gone through any number of versions um, from very early to um, quite recent, uh, in fact, um, if you remember Eddie Murphy there, um, it's still going on. So I'm going to use Solomon Northup again as a, as a sort of bridge here. Um, I'm going to read a, sec a short section of his book that describes the night that he and some other fellow, well, slaves at that time, were essentially herded through of all places, Washington, D.C., where he had been held in a slave pen, and they were being taken to a, uh, a, a boat on, the, on the, the river for transportation to another slave pen and another slave pen and so on. Um, now, that, the whole slavery issue, of course, just permeates the treatment of racial difference between African Americans and essentially whites. Uh, in the United States, and that's what we're going to be concentrating on mainly here today. So here's a short section of um, Northup's text. It was a dark night. All was quiet. I could see lights, or the reflection of them, over towards Pennsylvania Avenue, but there was no one, not even a straggler, to be seen. I was almost resolved to attempt to break away. Had I not been handcuffed, the attempt would certainly have been made, whatever consequence might have followed. Radburn, this is one of the minders, was in the rear, carrying a large stick and hurrying up the children as fast as the little ones could walk. And he refers to himself and his fellow slaves quite often as children or sometimes even as beasts in the book. And I hope you, you realize that he's, he's being um, ironic with those terms. So we passed, handcuffed and in silence, through the streets of Washington, through the capital of a nation whose theory of government, we are told, 
rests on the foundation of man's inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hail, Columbia, happy land indeed. You probably noticed an echo there of a famous American document. And if we could go forward. That document, of course, was penned by none other than Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. Northrop was clearly well aware of what the Declaration of Independence states. But here he was, a, a legally a free black man who had been handcuffed and enslaved and was being sent to, of all places, Louisiana, where he would spend those 12 years as a slave. Thomas Jefferson, what can I say? He was a Renaissance man, too. He um, was an integral part of the early days. He's considered a founding father. He has a monument in Washington, DC to him where he stands regally in, uh, uh, there's a statue. Um, most every state in the United States has some sort of Jefferson in it, Jefferson City, or just plain Jefferson. What's on the nickel? Thomas Jefferson, right? He's everywhere. But he was a complicated figure, and some of his writing indicates that. Now, I would prefer to concentrate on his more uplifting writing, but I'm not going to do that because today we're, we're dealing with race and ethnicity, and in this case, specifically race. Jefferson wrote a book. It was called Notes on the State of Virginia. It was the only full book he ever wrote, and it was a long treatise on all kinds of issues, governmental and social and religious and so on. Um, most of which is, is entirely um, not offensive. It's just in, informational. But there's one section of that book that is still famous, and he is still famous for. It's simply called Laws, and involves Jefferson's perception of racial differences. Now, I'm going to ask some students to read sections of this but before that happens, I want to point out that Jefferson had a lot on his plate. He, he, was, he was concerned with all kinds of issues, and this was just one of them. He had hoped to emancipate uh, the slave population during his lifetime. It didn't happen, but he had hoped to do that. In fact, he proposed several law, legal changes that would have resulted in emancipation of slaves. But he also saw some differences between what he called blacks and whites. He decided at one point in this book to write down what he perceived as the, the differences between the two races that made it pretty much, in his eyes, impossible for the two races to coexist in the same country. So I'm going to ask my readers to assemble up here. Um, yeah, I guess we're going to have to use the microphone, aren't we? So. There are, are nine sections here, and we'll go through each of them, they're fairly brief, uh, with a quick comment, but uh, you can draw your own conclusions as to uh, what we can make of Jefferson's ideas here. The first difference which, which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black of the Negro resides in the reticular membrane between the skin and scarf skin, or in the scarf skin itself, whether it proceeds from the color of the blood, the color of the bile, or from that of some other secretion, the difference is fixed in nature and is as real as if its seat and cause were better known to us. And is this difference of no importance? Is it not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty in the two races? Are not the fine mixtures of red and white, 
the expressions of every passion by greater or less suffusions of color in the one, preferable to that of eternal monotony, which reigns in the countenances, countenances that immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions of the other rays. Thank you, Max. Difference of color. And it's important to note that Jefferson attributed that to um, the differences that are fixed in nature. In other words, that there is a, for him, there was a scientific basis for that difference. Add to these flowing hair a more elegant symmetry of form, their own judgment and flavor of the whites, declared by the preference of them, as uniformly as the pre preference of the Uratan for black women over those of his own species. The circumstance of superior beauty is thought worthy of attention that propagation of our horses, dogs, and other domesticated animals. Why not that of man? That was quite something that he would write that. He, he essentially is saying that whites are more beautiful than blacks and that in fact um, black men are attracted to white women the same way that orangutans, male orangutans are attracted to black women. Besides those of color, figure, and hair, there are other physical distinctions proving a difference of race. They have less hair on the face and body. They secrete less by the kidneys and more by the glands of the skin, which gives them a very strong and disagreeable odor. This greater degree of transpiration renders them more tolerant of heat and less so of cold than the whites. Probably there's no more famous little passage in Jefferson's account than that one, which refers to the disagreeable odor. Um, it's, it's something that People have just wondered about why would Jefferson spend his time writing about and even thinking about such a frivolous difference among people. They seem to require less sleep. A black, after hard labor through the day, will be induced to the slightest amusements to set up till midnight or later, though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning. I'll just ask everyone, <laughs> if you were a, a slave, and you worked sun up to sundown, would you want to just go to sleep and do the same thing again the next day? Probably not. They are at least as brave and more adventuresome, but this may perhaps proceed from a want of forethought, which prevents their seeing a danger till it be present. When present, they do not go through it with more coolness or steadiness than the whites. One notable phrase. Uh, perhaps proceed from a want of forethought uh, in, in a great number of definitions of intelligence or humanness. Uh, the uh, facility of forethought is considered to be necessary for a high level of intelligence. They are more ardent after their female but love seems with them to be more an eager desire than a tender, delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. And as I was saying to Lauren the other day, <laughs> it's very clear to all of us that, of course, white men always approach females with a delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. Which I agree with. <laughs> The griefs are transient, those numberless afflictions, which render it doubtful whether heaven has given us life, in mercy or in wrath, are less felt and sooner forgotten with them. In general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. To this must be ascribed their disposition to sleep when abstracted from their diversions and unemployed in labor. An animal whose body is at rest and who does not reflect must be disposed to sleep, of course. Just a note, an animal is a word that Jefferson uses there. Um, he, he drifts closer and closer to that distinction of what is human and what is not human in his um, account of the differences there between the two races. Comparing them by their faculties of memory, reason, and imagination, it appears to me that in memory they are equal to the whites and reason much inferior. 
as I think one could scarcely be found capable of tracing and comprehending the investigations of Euclid. And in that imagination, they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. It would be unfair to follow them to Africa for this investigation. We will consider them here, on the same stage with the whites, and where the facts are not apocryphal. So he finally gets to it, uses the word inferior. And were it not that Jefferson has had such lasting influence, still today, um, both in literature and culturally, um, I think that we would probably have forgotten these passages, but they're still there, and they still have to be dealt with. Not a happy story, but it's true. The text is there. I am really running out of time. Yeah, I think this isn't Q&A time, right? Okay. I brought this fellow up on the screen. Just, I just want him to appear briefly. Um, he was well known in his time. As you can see, he lived through the middle of the 19th century up in, into the Reconstruction era. And um, Fitzhugh was a southerner who wrote ardently, speaking of ardent, uh, in defense of slavery, why slavery should be maintained. And um, he just had a couple of really interesting little quotes. Uh, I'll, I'll read a couple of these here. Uh, he argued that the Negro is but a grown-up child who needs the economic and social protections of slavery. Uh, he decried capitalism um, as a, a war of the rich with the poor and the poor with one another, rendering free blacks far outstripped or outwitted in the chase of free competition. Slavery, he contended, and uh, ensured that blacks would be economically secure and morally civilized. Now, I find those arguments entirely specious, but he was widely read as well in his time. So let's go forward. I wanted to cover a little more of this man, David Walker, but I'm just briefly going to mention that at the same time, virtually, that um, Jefferson was living and um, all those, those people like Fitzhugh were writing and so on. This man actually published a tract. Um, it's, it's entitled An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World and essentially says to everyone, look, we are just as much a part of the Declaration of Independence as anyone else. We are men, and we should be treated that way. And he, it, it, the interesting part of his story is that um, he was born a free black, and he moved to Boston, where he became a, a clothing merchant. And he, he published his tract, but it didn't go anywhere other than the Northeast, which was pretty much already an abolitionist stronghold. So we don't know if he did it or not, but apparently, the clothing that was sold um, out of his shop, a lot of it went to sailors. And either he or somebody close to him started sewing the tract into the clothing that was taken to southern ports, for instance, by sailors. And it, it actually was disseminated that way, which I think is, is pretty clever myself. OK. <laughs> Probably most of you are familiar with that fellow up on the screen. And uh, you are probably, most of you, familiar also with his most, probably, his most famous book, which would be Huckleberry Finn. Um, Huckleberry Finn um, is an iconic American book. And in fact, I'm going to read a quote about that book. This is a quote from Ernest Hemingway, who said, the good writers are Henry James, Stephen Crane, and Mark Twain. That's not the order they're good in. There is no order for good writers. 
all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. If you read it, you must stop where the nigger Jim is stolen from the boys. That is the real end. The rest is just cheating. But it's the best book we've had. All American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. There has been nothing as good since. Pretty high praise from a well-respected American writer himself, Hemingway. Um, I'm going to ask um, two students to read some sections of Huckleberry Finn. Um, I might stop you at certain points, but um, this is a section where Huck himself is trying to decide what's right about dealing with um, a runaway slave. The runaway, runaway slave's name is Jim, and these are the two men, well, Huckleberry at the, the, in the story is really only about 12 or 13 years old, but he still has to make a, a number of moral decisions in the book. So this is a section where he's trying to decide whether he should turn Jim in uh, to slave hunters. Uh, this will take a little while, but let's give it a try. All right? So we'll have Max and Melanie, and I will read a part two. Uh, Max is going to take the part of Huckleberry Finn. Melanie is going to be, take the part of Jim, and I'm going to take the part of the slave hunters. Jim talked out loud all the time while I was talking to myself. He was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state, he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent. And when he got enough, he would buy his wife, which was owned on a farm close to where Miss Watson lived. And then they would both work to buy the two children. And if their master wouldn't sell them, they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them. It most froze me to hear such talk. He would never dare to talk such talk in his life before. Just see what a difference it made in him the minute he judged he was about free. It was according to the old saying, give a nigger an inch and he'll take an out. Thinks I, this is what comes of my not thinking. Here was this nigger, which I had as good as help to run away, coming right out flat-footed and saying he would steal his children, children that belonged to a man I didn't even know, a man that hadn't ever done me no harm. I was sorry to hear Jim say that. It was such a lowering of him. My conscience got to stirring me up hotter than ever until at last I says to it, let up on me. It ain't too late yet. I'll paddle ashore at the first light and tell. I felt easy and happy and light and as a feather right off. All my troubles was gone. I went to looking out sharp for a light and sort of singing to myself. By and by one show and Jim sings out. We safe, Huck. We safe. Jump up and crack your fears. That's the good old Cairo at last. I just know you. Just a note that Cairo, Illinois, was the place that they were hoping to get to where Jim would be in a free state. They didn't know it. They'd already passed it. Well, I think Huck knew it, but it wasn't going to happen. I says, I'll take the canoe and go and see, Jim. It mightn't be, you know. He jumped and got the canoe ready and put his old coat in the bottom for me to set on it. He gave me the paddle, and as I shoved off, he says, Pretty soon I'll be a shouting for joy, and I'll say, It's on all accounts, oh, Huck. I was a free man, and I could have never been free if it hadn't been for Huck. Huck done it. Jim will never forget you, Huck. You's the best friend Jim's ever had, and you're the only friend old Jim's got now. I was paddling off, all in a sweat to tell on him. But when he says this, it seemed to kind of take the tuck all out of me. I went along slow then, and I weren't right down certain whether I was glad I started or whether I weren't. When I was 50 yards off, Jim says, Down you go is the old true huck, the only white gentleman that ever keep his promise to old Jim. Well, I just felt sick. But I says, I got to do it. I can't get out of it. Right then along comes a skiff with two men in it with guns, and they stop, and I stop. One of them says. So these would be the slave hunters. What's that yonder? A piece of raft, I says. Do you belong on it? Yes, sir. Any men on it? Only one, sir. Well, there's five niggers run off tonight up yonder above the head of the bend. Is your man white or black? I didn't answer up front. I tried to, but the words wouldn't come. I tried for a second or two to brace up and out with it, but I weren't man enough, having the spunk of a rabbit. I see I was weakening, so I just give up trying and up and says, he's white. 
I reckon we'll go and see for ourselves. I wish you would, says I, because it's Pap that's there, and maybe you'd help me tow the raft ashore where the light is. He's sick, and so is Ma'am and Mary Ann. Oh, the devil, we're in a hurry, boy. But I suppose we've got to. Come, buckle to your paddle, and let's get along. I buckled to my paddle, and they laid to their oars. When we had made a stroke or two, I says, Pap will be mighty obliged to you, I can tell you. Everybody goes away when I want them to help me tow the raft ashore, and I can't do it by myself. Well, that's infernal mean. Odd, too. Say, boy, what's the matter with your father? It's the, uh, the, well, it ain't nothing much. They stopped pulling. It weren't but a mighty little ways to the raft now, one says. Boy, that's a lie. What is the matter with your pep? Answer up square now, and it'll be, and it'll be the better for you. I will, sir, I will, honest. But, but don't leave us, please. It's the, the, gentlemen, if you only pull ahead and let me heave you the headline, you won't have to come near the raft. Please do. Set her back, John, set her back, says one. They backed water. Keep away, boy. Keep, to, keep the leeward. Confound it, I just expect the wind has blowed it to us. Your pap's got the smallpox, and you know it precious well. Why didn't you come out and say so? Do you want to spread it all over? Well, says I, a blubbering, I've told everybody before, and they just went away and left us. Poor devil, there's something in that. We are right down sorry for you, but we, well, hang it. We don't want the smallpox, you see. Look here, I'll tell you what to do. Don't you try to land yourself, or you'll smash everything to pieces. You float along down about 20 miles, and you'll come to a town on the left-hand side of the river. It'll be long after sunup then, and when you ask for help, you tell them your folks are all down with the chills and fever. Don't be a fool again and let people guess what is the matter. Now we're trying to do you a kindness, so you just put 20 miles between us. That's a good boy. It wouldn't do any good to land yonder where the light is. It's only a wood yard. Say, I reckon your father's poor, and I'm bound to say he's in pretty hard luck. Here, I'll put a $20 gold piece on this board, and you get it when it floats by. I feel mighty mean to leave you, but my kingdom, it won't do, a f do to fool with the smallpox, don't you see? Hold on, Parker, says the other man. Here's a 20 to put on the board for me. Goodbye, boy. You do as Mr. Parker told you, and you'll be all right. That's so, my boy. Goodbye. Goodbye. If you see any runaway niggers, you get help and nab them, and you can make some money by it. Goodbye, sir, says I. I won't let no runaway niggers get by me if I can help it. They went off and I got aboard the raft, feeling bad and low, because I knowed very well I had done wrong. And I see it weren't no use to, to, for me to try to learn to do right. A body that don't get started right when he's little ain't got no show. When the pinch comes, there ain't nothing to back him up and keep him to his work, and so he gets beat. Then I thought a minute and says to myself, hold on, suppose you'd done right and give Jim up. Would you felt better than what you did do now? No, says I, I'd feel bad. I'd feel just the same way I do now. Well then, says I, what's the use you learn to do right when it's troublesome to do right and ain't no trouble to do wrong and the wages is just the same? <laughs> I was stuck. I couldn't answer that. So I reckoned I wouldn't bother no more about it, but after this, always do whichever came handiest at the time. I went into the wigwam. Jim weren't there. I looked all around. He weren't anywhere. I says, Jim. Here I is, huh? Is he out of sight yet? Don't talk loud. He was in the river under the stern oar, with just his nose out. I told him they were out of sight, so he came aboard. He says, I was a listening to all the talk, and I slipped into the river, and was going to shrug her shoulder and come aboard. Then I was going to swim to the raft again when they was gone. Lordy, how you did fool him, Huck. That was the smartest dodge. I tell you, child, I expect it save old Jim. Old Jim ain't going to forgive you for that, honey. <laughs> Thank you. Twain really marked uh, a, a, a clear turning point in American literature concerning race. Um, he had seen in his, his childhood and early years, he had seen gangs of slaves being herded here and there and became a, absolutely an ardent abolitionist. Uh, but his cleverness in creating a passage like that one in which the young white boy believes he's doing the wrong thing 
by saving a runaway slave, but can't bring himself actually to turn Jim in is probably, in my mind, it, 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 it's a turn of literature that is far more effective than simply writing some sort of tract that says slavery is wrong and we should get rid of it. Jim becomes a real person in Huckleberry Finn, along with Huck. And I think that makes all the difference. Now, to my people, um, we're not going to have time, uh, Murray and Matthew, for our north section. Sorry, I overplanned. Um, what I'd like to do is, is race forward, so we have just a little question and answer time at the end, but I want um, we were going to look at Langston Hughes and listen to Langston Hughes a little bit. We were going to go into a little bit more of Northup with another reading, but I'd like to finish with something that I think is quite remarkable. Um, one more video from the, I, I believe it was the first inauguration of, it'll be the last one, of uh, Bill Clinton as president. And Shortly after the it, if we November election. The change from those years of Jefferson and Fitzhugh and um, the justification of slavery to having Maya Angelou uh, read a poem of her own at a presidential inauguration and the fact that now we have a, what is supposedly a, an African-American president really marks quite a change in the way literature has been viewed, has been addressed, has actually addressed itself, the whole racial issue. So let's listen to Maya Angelou as our final piece. And last noted educator, historian, and author, Dr. Maya Angelou, to compose a poem for this historic day. From Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and Wake Forest University, please welcome Dr. Angelo. Mr. President and Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Vice President and Mrs. Gore, and Americans everywhere, a rock, a river, a tree, hosts to species long since departed, marked the mastodon, the dinosaur, who left dry tokens of their sojourn here. Any broad alarm of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. But today, the rock cries out to us clearly, forcefully, Come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny, but seek no haven in my shadow. I will give you no hiding place down here. You, created only a little lower than the angels, have crouched too long in the bruising darkness, have lain too long face down in ignorance, your mouths spilling words armed for slaughter. The rock cries out to us today, you may stand upon me, but do not hide your face. Across the wall of the world, a river sings a beautiful song. It says, come, rest here by my side. Each of you, a bordered country, delicate and strangely made, proud, yet thrusting perpetually under siege. Your armed struggles for profit have left collars of waste upon my shore, currents of debris upon my breast. Yet today, I call you to my riverside, if you will study war no more. Come, clad in peace, and I will sing the songs the Creator gave to me when I and the tree and the rock were one before cynicism was a bloody seer across your brow, and when you yet knew, you still knew nothing. The river sang and sings on. 
There is a true yearning to respond to the singing river and the wise rock. So say the Asian, the Hispanic, the Jew, the African, the Native American, the Sioux, the Catholic, the Muslim, the French, the Greek, the Irish, the rabbi, the priest, the sheik, the gay, the straight, the preacher, the privileged, the homeless, the teacher, they all hear the speaking of the tree. They hear the first and last of every tree speak to humankind today. Come to me here beside the river. Plant yourself beside the river. Each of you, descendant of some past on traveler, has been paid for. You who gave me my first name. You, Pawnee, Apache, Seneca. You, Cherokee Nation, who rested with me, then forced on bloody feet, left me to the employment of other seekers, desperate for gain, starving for gold. You, the Turk, the Arab, the Swede, the German, the Eskimo, the Scot. You, the Ashanti, the Yoruba, the crew, bought, sold, stolen, arriving on a nightmare, praying for a dream. Here, root yourselves beside me. I am that tree planted by the river which will not be moved. I the rock, I the river, I the tree, I am yours. Your passages have been paid. Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the shape of your most private need. Sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your heart. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear, yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward offering you space to place new steps of change. Here, on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country, no less to Midas than the mendicant, no less to you now than the mastodon then. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes, and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. All right, looks like we have about two minutes for a question and answer session. Does anybody have any questions or comments that you'd like to offer? All right, if there are no questions, let's give Professor Tower a big hand. Thank you. Thank you all for your attendance. Yep. Thanks for coming. Much appreciated. Well, except for you in the front, of course. <laughs> so, Marie and Matthew, I do apologize for running out of time there. Yeah? That went pretty well. Okay, there's that. Thank you. Matt.